And I'm not ashamed of being a red, white, blue American. I love my country. And um, if you don't like it, I'm sorry for you. And we fought that you could have the freedom. Our men and women, our soldiers fought all through the decades of time. They fought that you have the freedom to stay and not like it. You have that freedom. You have the freedom to say you don't like it. You have that freedom. You say what you want. And but boy, that sweet, sweet American flag, it means something to me. It really does. Well, open your Bibles to Philippians chapter number two. Philippians chapter number two. My son's got the uh, projector off now. That light has scared me to death. Today I was walking around. Well, it's early this morning. I had my iced coffee in my hand. Hopefully my daddy's not watching. He is a lot like Lester Roloff. Doesn't like that coffee. And um, so for his sake tonight, I didn't drink coffee. I drank a Mount, Diet Mountain Dew. And, uh, but I carried this cup of coffee. And I'm walking around, you know. And I'm getting ready to come up to the office. It's oh right maybe a little before six or around that time and my wife comes around the corner head on and said i don't want to scare you like you scared me to death i almost fell down we both laughed forever um but what's that have to do with the sermon absolutely nothing but it was a good story all right philippians chapter number two and we're in verse number two. We didn't get very far this morning. But fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And we talked about fulfill the joy of uh, godly leaders. And then we said be like-minded. And then we had started to hit on love alike, love like Christ. And that's where we need to be as Christians. If you're a Christian, then you ought to be loving like Christ. Now, this isn't conditional. Do this. If you do this, you get this. No. If you're a Christian, you ought to just do this. That's what Christians are supposed to do. And uh, you've heard my illustration before. I was driving along on my way to college late one night. And this great big baby blue Cadillac on there, forget it, is big and a uh, gorgeous Cadillac. And it passed me. And then all of a sudden, stuff started hitting my windshield of my car. And they pull over. They had a big blowout. I pull out. And these three very large men get out. And they start walking to me. And um, they were from inner city Indianapolis. And they said, man, I don't, we don't know what to do. And I said, well, give me a second. Open the trunk. Now, of course, in my mind, there's probably a dead body in the trunk or something. These guys were big and they were kind of rough. And so they opened the trunk and they said, uh, do you know where the spare tire is? I said, no, but we can find it. So I pulled back the carpet and moved back, moved away the cocaine and the drugs. And I'm just joking. There was no cocaine, no drugs. But I pulled back the carpet and there was the spare tire and all the stuff. And we take out the spare and... It always is humorous to me when you get these enormous cars and then you put that little donut on it. It's just absolutely hilarious. And so we jack the car up, took, take the tire. Well, I say we loosely. I jack the car up and they said, oh, that's how that works. And I take the tire off. And, and uh, just a word of reference, boys, always loosen those lug nuts before you start raising the tire. Just telling you, it's, it's hard to do the other way. And so took the tire off, put it in the trunk, what was left of it, put the donut on there. Get finished, and man, these guys are just so appreciative. Thank you so much, man. We can't believe you stopped, and we can't believe anybody stopped for us. And da 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 I said, well, um, I'm going to go on my way, but I appreciate it. And I started handing out my gospel tracts. And it got real quiet. They said, what is this? I said, well, this tells you how to get to heaven. Do you know if you're going to heaven? And, of course, most of them said yes. And the one real slender man looked at me, and he goes, man, this is what Christians are supposed to be doing. Just though that terminology completely. This is what Christians are supposed to be doing. You know, if you're a Christian, there should be things that are expected out of you. 
Now, we don't want anyone to expect anything out of us, and that's kind of the world we live in right now is don't, don't put pressure on me and don't judge me. You know what? We should be okay with being judged some, which shouldn't bother us. We ought to live a lifestyle where people could look at us and say they live a godly example. Shouldn't we do that in our Christian life? We ought to love alike and love like Christ. And we look at John chapter 13, verse 34, it says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, and that ye love one, that ye also love one another. By this shall a man shall all men, excuse me, know that ye are my disciples. How are people going to know that I am a follower of Christ by my love for them? My Lord and Savior, his love was evident to me. Went to the cross of Calvary. And there's the story where someone said, said, how much does Jesus love me? And someone said, he loves you this much. And then he was crucified. And that's how much our Lord loves us, is that he gave himself for us. And so in our lives, we ought to have that unity that only comes through a true love for someone else. Love is not a taking action. It is a giving decision. Remember that love is not a taking action. It is a giving decision. And so uh, my daughter is engaged to be married. Well, she's got a big decision to make. Number one, do I love this person? Number two, is this an emotion or is this love that is a decision? See, when I make a decision, I will love you in sickness and in health for better and for worse, and it's going to get worse. I should have got an amen there. <laughs> My wife could amen until the cows come home. Sometimes marriage can get really bad. So I made a commitment. I made the decision to love you in sickness and health. When you fix steak and when you fix chicken rice. I love you at all times. Why? Because it's a decision I made. Even when it's not easy. My wife and I will have the children. I know you think my children are perfect. No, I know you know my children aren't perfect except for the one daughter, and I won't tell which one that is. And so, um, but with my children, I've heard my wife say it. Well, Mom, you're mad at me. I don't even know if you love me or something silly. And my wife says, I love you with all of my heart, but right now it's not very easy to like you. Moms, have you been there? Come on, crew. Yeah, I have one mom waving her hand like this. I thought she was going to get out pom-poms. And sometimes it's not easy to love. Sometimes it's not easy to love me. I get that. I understand. But sometimes it's not easy to love other folks. But when you really consider what Christ did for you, how he loved you though you sinned against him. He loved you and died for you knowing that you're going to sin against him again. That you're going to fail him. He already knows the inward thoughts, the motivations and the outward actions of your past and of your future. Mr. Calvin, he loves you anyway. He loves me anyway. Isn't that wonderful? And if he can do so much, can't I put myself back a little bit? See, because really, when we're in unity, and we're going to be talking about that all through the sermon today, and, and may, mainly if you're a Christian, you ought to have a unity with the brethren or be at unity with the brethren. And when I look at my life, isn't it the least he could ask for me to love you after all he's done for me? So we look and we ought to love each other like Christ. Well, let's go back to that passage of scripture. 
as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this all men know that ye are my disciples. Oh, so how will men know if you're the Lord's disciples? If you're his disciple, love me. If you're his disciple, love the people on this side of the pew, on this side of the aisle. If you're his disciple, love the people on this side of the aisle. If you're his disciple, why aren't you loving the person who's next to you? And then it becomes a question. But this isn't, again, I want to go back. This isn't conditional. This is not a question. This is an argument. This is abrasive. If you love him, keep his commandments. If he loved him, if you're his disciple, then love us one another. Is that the heart that you have? That you love all people? Oh, the Bible tells us about love. And it teaches us that if you love someone who is lovely, you get what I'm doing here? Okay. What profit have you? But if you love someone who's not lovely, I'm just messing. But if you love someone who's not lovely, there's the profit. There is profit in that. You have reward in giving and going that extra mile. We had the deacons and trustees meeting today. And as they left, as they looked in the back of my office, there's a little red polo shirt. We call them jerseys. And facing up, there's a little name, three-letter word named Kim. Now, some of you don't remember Kim, but she's very precious to me because she's very precious to my mother. I never knew Kimmy the way my mom did. Kimmy had some real bad health issues, and my mom loved her. And then when my mom would get sick, Kimmy would call her. And Kimmy was on death at death's door, and she was still calling my mother and checking on her. You know why? Because there's that love. My mom said, I love you, and proved it. And then Kimmy reciprocated, and she said, I love you too. And then when my mom wasn't feeling bad, and Kim's health was totally gone, and soon she passed, and my mom was heartbroken. We came to the funeral. But what was there? There was a heart for people. Do you have a heart for people? For the lovely, for the unlovely, for those who are easy to love, and for those who are the antagonist, we ought to love, love like Christ. And then we ought to be a part of the team. You ought to be a part of the team, one accord. In one accord, you ought to be part of the team. And Psalm 133, verse 1, it says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, we ought to have unity at Calvary Baptist Church. You ought to have unity in your home. You ought to have unity in the church. We ought to be unified and brought together. It's a blessing. You want a blessed home? Then you fight for unity. You fight to work things out. I see a lot of homes and a lot of people who have heavy hearts and broken hand families and broken homes and they strive for unity but here's the problem is when there is selfishness in a in a, a father's heart or a mother's heart or a child's heart that totally destroys the unity of the home and we we have a hard time growing together and then when we don't have that we are not a blessed home and then we look in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 25 and it says this and Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto him, unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself cannot stand. Oh, we've seen that. Some of you have experienced that firsthand. In a relationship, you tried everything you could think of. But it takes two, at least two, to have a relationship. Young people, you're looking for a mate, looking for a guy or a girl, 
One day you'll be thinking about dating. One day you'll think about marriage. Oh, you better choose wisely because a house divided against itself cannot stand. It won't stand. Right. So we seek the Lord's face and then we seek someone who is willing to sacrifice to keep a relationship at flow. And we need that in the church. How many churches have we seen over the years that have been destroyed because of the tongue? They're just angry. I've walked into church and seen people and talked to them and said, how are you today? I'm fine. And then later I could tell there was something amiss and I'd walk up to them and I'd say, hey, could I talk to you for a minute? Okay. I feel like there's something not right here and I want to get it right. Is there something wrong? No, Brother John, everything's great. And they never darken the door of the church again and go around the community spreading lies and rumors and everything. You know what? They were divided against themselves. They were divided and had no intention to get things right. Wouldn't even give a person a chance to get right. What is that? That, that proud heart. Oh, we ought to humble ourselves. You know, the most humbling thing in my life is when I do something against Brother Aaron, and then I look him in the set face and say, Brother Aaron, forgive me for what I did to you. I am so sorry. Now, Aaron can't forgive sin, but he can forgive me of what I've done. But I got to tell you, looking somebody in the face and asking him to forgive you is very humbling. I believe that's one of the reasons that we're in the I'm sorry society. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You are sorry. <laughs> we want to say that you are very sorry. But I like, will you forgive me? Now, it can be shallow, too. But I'm sorry isn't necessarily biblical. But an apology, Brother Randy, maybe I am sorry that I have done something against you. Would you forgive me for what I've done to you? And I'll do better. I'll treat you better. Whatever that um, cry for forgiveness is, what is it? It's that meek and humble spirit asking for forgiveness. That's hard to do. I'm sorry. It's real easy. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, I smashed my thumb. I'm sorry. I stubbed my toe. Ooh, hate that. Step on a Lego. Oh, I'm sorry I did that. No, it's beyond just I'm sorry. It is that desire to fix something that you broke. Be part of the team. My dad always said you're either on the construction crew or the deconstruction crew or demolishing crew, demolition crew. You can't be on both. And there are some people in churches tonight that are demolishing from inside out. Oh, they wouldn't run through a wall, but they sure knock somebody over with their mouth. They speak evil, they gossip, and we'll get into that a little bit more here in a minute. And then be minded of Christ. Minded of Christ. And in my heart, I believe that I should continually have thoughts of Christ. I ought to keep Christ in the forefront of my thinking, concentrating on him. And then not only should I be minded of Christ, but I should be Christ minded. My thoughts are guided by him and guided by his words. So now my thoughts aren't just of him, but they're guided by him. If you're a Christian, isn't that what you should be doing? If you're a Christian, then get about it. The mind of Christ or minded of Christ and then Christ minded. In Philippians 2, 5, it says this. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Then we look at like minded with Christ. So we have minded of Christ and Christ minded. Now we have like-minded with Christ. Then we look at Psalm chapter 100, verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. 
What is that? That like-mindedness with Christ, it affects my service to him. He served all the way to Calvary, and he never slowed. And as the men sang tonight, he took the hill, and he took it for me. If you're a Christian, don't lose the inward attack to strife and vainglory. Let's look at verse number three now. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem other better than himself. Don't lose the battle to inward strife and inward vainglory. Work with good intentions. Sometimes we have folks that will come and do a job. And outwardly, they're there. And they're working hard. They're working diligently. They're completing the task. But inside them, it's vain glory. They're doing it to be seen. When I worked in camp, I had a friend of mine, a good friend. And uh, he said, every time we get ready to do a job, you always vote to go with me. And so I think I've used this illustration before, but it bears repeating. So he said, uh, uh, I'm on the push mowers today, which nobody wanted to do the push mowing, uh, just like I would not want to go after hearing the Sunday school lesson this morning. No way will I ever volunteer to help Aaron Gamble push mow his lawn. Lord, help me. And uh, hopefully that's like a six foot deck on his push mower because that is just ludicrous. But one way or another, I go to camp, and we had to mow all this, and it was called Hoosier Hills and Hills everywhere. And nobody ever wanted to do the push mower. The hills were so steep, if you mowed too long, the oil would go to one side and start blowing, coming out. What is that, the breather? Is that right, Brother Randy? And the oil start pouring out the breather. Of course, you know what that means to a teenage boy. Keep going till it stops. And then sooner or later, it goes, and it stops, and you're done working for the day until Brother Boat Doyle would buy a new mower. Brother Butch, we would go through three to four mowers every year. One boy said, Brother Doyle said, put oil in the mower before you use it. You boys are running them out of oil. Well, I can tell you where it all went. It's halfway down the hill because we're mowing like this. We came up, this guy tore up a mower. I thought I told you to put oil in it. He did. Until when you put the dipstick in, the oil poured out. He filled it to the top. It was full. Bet me it was full. Way too much oil. We went through so many push mowers, it was hilarious. In fact, when they drained the pond, I think they even found a push mower or two. Nonetheless, so my friend came up. And he said, go with me. And he chose push mowing. I was like, I don't want push mow. There's only one thing worse than push mowing. Weed eating. <laughs> oh, couldn't stand weed eating. You would get done two, three hours of weed eating, and you're, you could still feel the vibration in your fingers. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody understand that? You go to take a bite of your sandwich, and you're like, is my hand moving, or is it my imagination? And uh, we would sit down, and so I, I went out there to mow. And so... He brought a string, a shoestring along. He tied the, the kill handle down because that's what's smart. That's not on there because it's safe. It's just on there to be a nuisance, apparently. And he tied it down. Don't do that. It's not safe. And so he tied it down. And he said, come over here. And we sat down. And I said, aren't you taking the first shift? He said, no. All they're going to do, you think any of them are going to walk all the way out here to see if we're mowing? We'll just sit out here. I said, are you kidding me? He said, no. I said, man, I can't do that. I can't do that. You know what? Sometimes we do that in our Christian life. Go, Lord, look at my action. But inside of me, it's dark. What's the Bible talk about? Those whited sepulchers. And you can go out to the graveyard today and see $10,000, $20,000 monuments. But it doesn't change the fact that underneath it lies death, an empty shell. Oh, the stone is beautiful. When we do these actions, oh, we can be seen of men. And they might 
Sing our praises, but it's vain glory if our heart's wrong. I talked to my daughter not long ago, and she was complaining about something, and I just looked at her, and she said, I know, I'm losing my every blessing. I didn't have to say it. You know, why? Because we drilled it into her conscience, because Miss LeSure drilled, drilled it into my conscience. I talked in the meeting tonight, I said, parents, and this is a good thing to remember, parents, you got your listening ears on? A parent and te parents and teachers train a conscience. When a sorry and simple excuse is good enough to appease a parent, it will also be good enough in the future to appease their conscience. Are you, are you with me? I know it's kind of wordy. Let me try it one more time. If a parent is training the conscience and guiding and preachers and teachers and, and, and folks that are guiding these children, if they are training a conscience in this child, now think about this. Then mom and dad get a sorry excuse from a child and they say, sure, okay, that's good enough. We'll say it's, I'm going to miss church because um, I got a, a burning eye or my hair is a mess or I'm tired, mommy. If that's all that it takes to appease mom and dad, then it'll also be enough to appease their conscience when mom and dad aren't there anymore. That's right. And so we have to be careful, parents, what we allow to be a good enough excuse because that excuse will continue in their life when they're adult and you're not there. My daughter Lydia said, ugh, when does my conscience quit having your voice? Every time I get feel bad about something, I hear you. I said, well, lucky you. Uh, <laughs> No lighted sepulchers, no darkened heart with washed hands serving the Lord. No dark hearts, clean hands. We'll wash those hands, but inside, it's a dark heart. We're suffering through this COVID-19 thing. And if someone walked up to you and said, hey, I'm here to work with you. I want to help you paint your house or whatever. And you say, sure, come on. He said, now I just want you to know I got COVID-19, but I washed my hands really good. You'd say, I've gone home. Why? Because you, you're carrying something that can't be seen, but it's very dangerous. And that's where we see a lot of people in our church are coming in with washed hands and the outside looks good, but the heart is dark. We have to be careful. No good works with evil intentions. I think of the people who pray when we come to this passage of scripture. And dear Lord, I thank you and I praise you that I am not nearly as bad as that publican over there. What is that? A good work? Well, we would say prayer is good. We have the total wrong intention. And so he took something that could have been glorifying to God and he drug it through the gutter. He, he, he tried to make it something about his glory and it became vain glory. We must in our lives replace strife with harmony. We must replace vain glory with humility. We look in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 2, and it says this with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, suffering, forbearing one another. In love. Isn't it interesting how many times love comes up, but lowliness, meekness, long suffering, forbearance. You know, in your family, if we would all kind of grab that in all of our families, that would change our whole dynamic at home, wouldn't it? If we would all claim Ephesians 4 2 in our lives, if you're a Christian, do all while keeping your tongue in check. Do it all while keeping your tongue in check. Let's look down to verse number 13. I believe that's the right verse. 14, excuse me. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Children, look at me real quick. This deals with you. Do all things without murmuring and disputing. No disputing. 
no disputing. We just do it. You say, well, I don't like it. You don't have to like it. We just do it. We do it without murmuring, without disputing. We had to come up with a lot of weird ideas and weird things in Calvary Christian School. And I praise my staff because as far as I know, uh, if you murmured and disputed behind my back, I hope, no. No murmuring. But John knows. It's tough. Somebody has to make the decision. Make it and we'll do it. Without murmuring. Without disputing. We've seen churches split over the color of the pews, the color of the carpet, the type of bathrooms we have. We've seen silliness happen in our churches. And you know what happens? It is your tongue. It is your tongue. It is your tongue. That's the problem. Without murmurings or disputings. In James chapter number 3 and verse number 8 it says, But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Oh, it is. It's destroyed marriages. It's destroyed families. And it's destroyed churches. Keep your tongue in check and judge your speech. Before you say it, is it good? Is it profitable? Is it helpful? Does it bring people closer to the Lord? Is it an edifying word? We live in a world now with young people who are just so mean. Stupid, idiot, moron, jerk. I just mean words. Words mean something. Wars are started with words. Be careful what you say. Because I doubt you would say, hey, you jerk, why don't you get saved and actually have a good result? What is it? It's not doing anything for God's glory. Mrs. LeSure, boy, it's pick on her day. I was in school. I wasn't a nice person. I know that's so hard for you to believe, but I wasn't. That wasn't the time to laugh. She said, anytime you put somebody down, you're slapping them in the face so you can come all the way around and pat yourself on the back. Have you heard that before? When you start cutting others down, it's just to make yourself self feel better about you. Be careful. Be careful that you guard your tongue. Keep your tongue and it'll keep you out of trouble. In Proverbs 21, 23, Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. We have young people in our school that just can't shut their mouth. Poor little things. They just can't shut their mouth. And I'll take them and they'll come to my office and they'll say, I'll say, why are you here? Back talk. I said, really? That old mean teacher picking on you? That Mrs. Weldy picking on you? No. Maybe. Oh, well, that's not right. What happened? Well, they told me to do this. I told them I didn't want to. Oh, well, that's disputing, murmuring. If you just kept your mouth shut, you did it. Well, I didn't want to. Well, here's the thing. It didn't change anything. Murmuring and disputing and fighting and arguing, and we see it all the time with children and adults alike, husbands and wives, like we said this morning, arguing about the direction to go to Burger King of all foolish things. It's silliness. James 1.26 If any man among you seem to be religious and brightly not his tongue, he deceiveth his own heart. You know what a flopping tongue full of venom shows? It's proof positive that my religion is in vain. That what I do see on the outside, no matter the suit, jacket, the tie, that in my heart, there's dead hands and bones. A telltale sign of your spiritual life will always be your tongue. Unity in the church. We have folks today that are hurting. They're not here. 
some sick, some afflicted, some staying in, trying to stay safe from this coronavirus, but they need you. The folks here tonight need you. Our nation needs you. They need that tongue. They need a Christian to do what a Christian ought to be doing. Is that who you're going to be? Wouldn't it be a shame if our tongues did more cutting down, showed more disapproval than they did edification? More disapproval and more anger than they did share the gospel. Judge yourself. Look at what you say. Because there are some things a Christian shouldn't say. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you move in our midst tonight. Pray that you take this service for your honor, for your glory. Pray that you lead, guide, and direct us, Father, to do your will. Bless us tonight. Bless these that are here. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're